Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 555th episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today we have Layla Gray. She's the founder of Propaganda Fluent. I ran across her on the Instagram. And, you know, I've been talking about propaganda for several years. Uh, I dove very deep into it um, when I was preparing for my keynote out in Slovenia a few years ago. Uh, probably four years ago now, actually coming up. But, um, you know, it's been with us for at least 100 years. Uh, Layla says going back to the 1600s with the Catholic Church. and uh, But certainly in a business standpoint and in war, it's been with us for well over 100 years. It was used to get us into World War One. It's been used in business. It's been used by governments around the world for well over 100 years, you know, ever since. So you need to know what is going on. We get into politics, we get into COVID, we get into business, uh, because these tools are being used against us, okay? You hear people say, oh, it's not polite to talk about, you know, sex, religion, politics, money, and mixed company. It's like, well, hell, that's all I want to talk about, you know? And because we've had generations of people like that, now we can't have any good, decent communication, without somebody flying off the handle, getting upset, wanting to kill the other person. That's how wars start. If you can't hold two diametrically opposed ideas in your head and consider them without going crazy, then what good are you? You're just a mouthpiece. Piece. You're an ideologue. You're carrying the water from for somebody that I guarantee you is pulling your strings. They're using propaganda against you, and you don't even know it. Same holds true for marketing. Plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. The scratchy, st- stuffy, oh, I just remembered this. My son was sick a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we brought him some NyQuil. The nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching stuff. He had fever, so you can rest medicine. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, lettuce on a sesame seed bun. These things stick with us. It's propaganda. Yeah, it's marketing. Yes, it's persuasion. Um, you know, versus manipulation, because ultimately, I mean, all right, it's for good. You know, take some medicine, you get some sleep, you get better. Yeah. Fast food's not great for you, but eat it now and then. All right, fine. But these things are going on. You know, if they say in poker, if you don't know who the sucker is at the table, then it's you. If you think you're immune to this, I guarantee you're the easiest one to manipulate. So pay attention to what we talk about. Understand how you can apply it in business. Understand how you can apply it in life. Understand how to make yourself more resilient. I don't know if we can become immune to it, but you can certainly become more resilient. You can detect it to reduce its effects. Okay, to make sure you're not the easy mark. Because look, muggers, they don't go after the the second strongest person. They go after the weakest so just being the the second least weak person could keep you alive tomorrow. All right. But again, understand how this is being used in marketing, in persuasion. Um, can you detect these things and, uh, you know, become a, a better salesperson, become a better human, become a better citizen of the world? I think that's what you'll get out of this. Okay. You know, today we got into building your story brand in uh, the Sell More of Everything community. Last week we got into Atomic Habits. Um, you know, avail yourself. You know, join us, sellmoreofeverything.com. Every week I'm on live. There's a private group. Uh, ask your questions. Don't go at this alone. And by this, I mean life. Sales, business, life. Okay, you're not alone. The devil wants you to think you're alone. If your company won't pay for it, you pay for it. I am literally on this trajectory. You are literally listening to me right now because back in 2000, late, oh, late 2005, 
I invested in myself. I invested $600 in a 12-week teleclass. I had already been making at least $100,000 a year since 1998. I invested $600 in a teleclass. We got a PDF and 12 phone calls, one hour apiece. It changed my life. So invest in yourself okay there are month-to-month -month options and uh, you can save a whole bunch and invest in yourself for a year but dip your toe in the water if you'd like you get the entire video training series on the make every sale and that's yours to keep all right so jump in come join us and you will sell more you will sell more of everything.com now let's bring on our guest Layla Gray, all the way from SoCal, my fellow propagandist. Are, are, are we propagandist or are we anti-propagandist? I don't know. Answer that in just a minute. Welcome to the sales podcast. How the heck are you? I'm doing great. Staying busy in LA. Very nice. Uh, I don't know how you can stand it out there. There's propaganda everywhere. You know, at least, at least I'm like 90 miles out of the chaos, but, uh, you're like, you're behind enemy lines fighting the good fight, huh? I am. I am. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty glamorous fight. So I don't mind. <laughs> That's cool. So I ran across you on the Instagram. Uh, you are building out a brand, uh, Propaganda Fluent, right? Uh, it's not your full-time job yet, but... Um, <laughs> what got you into that? Because I've, I've always been interested with it. I dove in deep a few years ago, I was giving a, a keynote talk in Slovenia of all places. Oh, wow. And um, I want to talk about the role of propaganda and how it, it's origin. People don't really know it going back over a hundred years. You know, it was used in war. It was then applied in business. It was used in war again. <laughs> it's still being used in war and business, but uh, what, what got you interested in, in going down this journey? Well, to start off, I was homeschooled. So my parents, um, thankfully, took me out of the system. And um, being a homeschooled person, you sort of have this natural tendency to think outside the box. And I thought in terms of skills that would be essential for me to learn and something that would help me in life, um, I thought being able to convince people to work in my best interests would most likely end in good results for me and, and hopefully other people. So, you know, I, at a young age, just started thinking about, okay, how does the mind work? How do social systems work? How do cultures work? You know, things like that. So, so how old were you when, when you realized this could bear fruit? Oh, I never thought of it in terms of, something to do. I never imagined I would have a social platform. Right, but, but even that, I mean, were you like in middle school, high school? Oh yeah. Or? When I was 13, I started to understand like one of my favorite books that I first got was the logic of failure and this other book called white bears and other unwanted thoughts. And it opened white, me up uh, white, bears white, bears, white bears and oh. other unwanted thoughts. Okay. <laughs> and it opened me up to understanding more about how the human mind works and how people don't really have full capacity over their logic and thinking. Um, when we, you know, we think we're in control, but we're really not. Mm -hmm. And so naturally understanding what happened in world war II, um, understanding how a society could be so radically transformed in such a short time. Um, I just connected the two and just started to learn more and more. What was the, what was the first book you mentioned? Oh, the logic of failure. Okay. I'm taking some notes and I'm going to look those up. <laughs> yeah, pretty interesting. And that one's more about systems thinking. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, cool. And, um, you know, we, we've homeschooled for 14 years now and, um, we've homeschooled some or part of the education of five of our seven children. Oh, wow. Congrats. Uh, so kudos to you for, for jumping on that and, and, you know, pulling on that thread and following it. Uh, Cause that is one of the benefits of homeschooling and, and school in general, you know, should have more, um, I don't know, variance or, or breadth. You know, if, if a kid is into sports, 
he can learn math and statistics and, and English. If you just nurture that, right? Hey, write me a report on your favorite baseball player. You know, get what's the, what's the average, what does, what would Joe have to, how many more hits would he have to get to raise his, his batting average, you know, 0.023%. But they don't do that, right? It's just so, I just cram kids in, but but I digress. Yeah. So um, do you remember um, an early time or uh, one of your first big wins, if you will, of of understanding the brain and being able to, you know, guide a conversation or did did you ever have like an Obi-Wan moment? These are not the droids you're looking for. (laughs) Yeah, I would say so. Um, In terms of how I started my career, um, I I started my career in tech when it wasn't as, let's say, structured in terms of how you can, oh, you can come learn a skill. There was computer science, but I'm more in the creative and product area. Um, so there wasn't like all of these education systems, the, the, the schools weren't really teaching it up to date. So you sort of just had to, you know, get out there, you know, get some funding, get this, you know, <laughs> uh, it was the wild west, uh, the second wave of the wild west, obviously, um, of tech and, um, yeah, just started pitching and, you know, people wanted to work with me and I, I just, you know, thrived and we developed and everyone grew and, and I actually started like a magazine. So, you know, oh. it helped, it, it definitely helped to kickstart everything and get attention because it's very competitive in the tech world. Sure. Um, it's competitive everywhere, but especially in tech, you, you really have to make your personal brand known. So you were creating your own business, like it's doing marketing or what, what did you build with that? Oh yeah. For, I was doing freelancing okay. and I also had a magazine, like a small blog. And so I had a couple of people working there on the blog. And then um, we also got contracts for design work. Mm-hmm. So would you say, um, is there an overlap or even a difference between propaganda and persuasion and, and even marketing? Are they kind of all sort of similar, but maybe the, the motives are different? Yes. So um, propaganda is a form of persuasive communication, um, but propaganda, it was originally um, constructed like the first propagandist was the actually the Roman Catholic Church because they wanted to propagandize their religion and spread their religion out. So we can see how successful that was. <laughs> they did a really good job <laughs> at that. Um, that was, I believe, in like the 1600s when they formed that. And uh, propaganda, though, it's taken a downturn um, from the original sort of intention of spreading a message because it's largely built on logical fallacies and concealing the true intentions of the propagandist. Like I might be selling you an idea that might seem to result in one thing for you, but in fact, I know that it's gonna result in some consequence that you actually don't like. So that's why I have to conceal. Ah, yeah. so, so did propaganda, did, did it have a, a positive connotation in the beginning and has kind of been misused and abused? You know, so now it has that negative connotation or was it always like, uh, like ill intent under it, behind it? Well, I think if you look at a lot of church practices and the way that they pushed religion and what the product they were selling, you could argue it, you know, it never had the greatest, you know, it was always sort of backed by some type of coercion, like whenever the church was going to take over land, not to say that Catholicism or anything is, is, is inherently bad or pushing religion is bad, just that there's always seemed to be an underlying coercion behind propaganda. Like there is going to be violence backed <laughs> by this <laughs> at some level. Um, the, the church itself, they, they were pretty convincing propagandists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So how has it evolved or or has it evolved since then? Because I was, uh, the things I was studying uh, was looking at Edward Bernays and his role in the early 1900s. um, And then how 
it was leveraged in World War I. Then they had this body of work that they're like, what do we do with all this knowledge? He's like, hey, let's sell some stuff, right? So it was used in business. Uh, then, mm-hmm. of course, World War II, uh, Hitler, and even the United States. I mean, hey, let's, let's raise some bonds, you know, buy a bond, you know, support mm-hmm. our troops, blah, blah, blah. So um, it's, it's not always bad. But I mean, like when I hear propaganda, it's to me, it's a negative connotation, even though maybe somebody's trying to use it for good. Yeah, there is the white, black and gray propaganda, like during wartime, getting people to become, you know, more uh, on board with things and and supporting their country. That would be like white propaganda where um, selling the ideas of freedom, for example, if you're propagandizing freedom during um, Soviet Russia, you know, you're sending that to the Soviet Russians, that would be like a white form of propaganda. Like the government wouldn't like it, but it would be, let's say, good for the people because it's advocating for freedom and the American dream and things like that. Um, And then obviously World War II is a good example of Black propaganda. That's just um, not great at all. Um, And that, I think, has been, uh, for me, like the most perfect example of what propaganda is. They just were all out. They used every medium of communication. They used audio. They used written. They used art. They used film. They heavily utilized all these different methods. And they just really implemented really, really well to not only push their message and, and sensationalize their people, but also to demoralize um, their, their enemies. Sure. Uh, so what is driving you to build this, the propaganda fluent? Um, I'm personally, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, I'm political. Um, I'm I've got seven kids. I'm worried about the future. You know, yeah. I, um, uh, I'd love to be quiet and just go binge on some movies, but, I mean, I need to leave the world a better place. So like I I look for this stuff and, um, you know, I ran across you, um, you're building this out. You got a podcast, YouTube channel, TikTok, Instagram. Um, It's like, goodness gracious, where where are you going to take this? (laughs) One second. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) No sweat. Uh, The city. I've had barking dogs, crying kids. I've I've brought Ava on the show. <laughs> okay, I think they're done. Yeah, I can't hear it, so you're good. Okay, um, so for me, um, it's just a passion of mine. And when they implemented, or when um, Biden said he was going to be, you know, mandating and forcing, obviously, um, well maybe not so obviously, but I am a big proponent of medical freedom. I don't like anyone using coercion to convince people to do anything. So um, I understand how maybe in the short term, that might be a good thing um, if for whatever reason, but in long term, in terms of society and the evolution of humanity, we should have freedom rather than coercion and ultimately (laughs) enslavement let's just be honest Mm -hmm. so um yeah i'm totally against that and uh obviously the 2020 the whole the whole situation regardless of how you feel about you know the pandemic it was an incredibly intense propaganda and media campaign Mm -hmm. um you do not manipulate and coordinate the behavior of billions of people on the planet without a well-coordinated propaganda campaign. That's just, you can't do it. Like whatever it is, even if it was for good, or maybe, you know, if you disagree with that and think it was for bad, you had to utilize propaganda. We saw that every day during the lockdowns. um, They, that's when we got our first really big re-education. That's when we had the nonstop news. I, I know I was addicted to the news. So um, we got introduced at how everything was going to be perceived. They would make headlines very early on uh, forecasting, okay, this is the new normal. These are all, it was all just very obviously propaganda. Um, for a lot of people, they're not familiar with that. So they don't see 
where the, the narrative is building. They don't see how they're connecting the dots. They don't see how all of these things are sort of, you know, intertwined. Even, you know, making films and TV shows, they primed um, a lot of our response to pandemics over the last couple of years with a lot of films. So that could be even seen as, you know, part of the propaganda in a lot of ways to condition responses. So I just, uh, when they said they were going to basically make it impossible for people like me to work, um, I said, okay, well, what's, what's, <laughs> what's left? Let me just get out here and start to build a community and start to connect with like minds so that, you know, hopefully we can, we can shift some of these things. Well, Layla, look, you're young and, you know, this was all for the good and, and the greater good. They, they meant well. And, you know, this was unique. This, this time was different. And, was. you know, you clearly do not love your grandmother. Okay. <laughs> you want all grandmothers to die. And so I'm not listening to you. Yes. I have misinformation. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, all right, I'm gonna play devil's advocate, right? Because mm -hmm. people will they'll say, well, how could this be coordinated, right? I mean, it happened in China and then Italy, everybody was dying in Italy and it was just terrible. And then it hit here. And it's not like Trump had a meeting with Mark Khan or Ma what's the French dude? Macron? Macron? <laughs> what, what is it? Macron. <laughs> Macron, right? And Trudeau. Mm -hmm. and Boris and everybody. And I mean, we all did what was prudent and, but they just followed the science. It's not like they're, it's the big cabal and the Illuminati is just locking it down. So all the rich can create the new world order. I mean, that's just nonsense. Um, well, <laughs> yes and no, except unfortunately they went on TV and told us that they were going to use this for their agendas. So whether or not it was man-made or it was something that just was, you know, a freak of nature, at the end of the day, they've already, you know, Klaus Schwab has said this is a unique opportunity to shift humanity. So mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm more interested in. And that's something that people should focus on because I feel like the first lesson you should know in terms of being able to be defensive uh, against propaganda is always look what's the end goal what is the end result if you're forcing policies that are going to result in the normalization of coercion and people having to do irreversible medical procedures what's the end result of that what is that going to look like in 10 years when let's say um, somebody you might not support who's in office and has taken office and decided everybody needs to take mandatory um, hormones, you know, any random thing, you always have to look at what the end result is going to be. And then that way you can sort of, you know, you can sort of um, reimagine or reconfigure what is, let me see this. But you know, the, but people, mm -hmm. they literally, they literally can't see it. No, they can't. It, it's, it's like they've, they've been brainwashed or hypnotized. You know, there was a, an interesting take on this. Um, I was listening to Jordan Peterson years ago. And he said, you know, when, when people think of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, they see themselves as the hero. Right. Oh, I would be the one to hide Anne Frank and, and I would smuggle Jews out and I would sneak them food. I would I would stand up to this he's like statistically you you were wrong right like such a small percentage of humans in that scenario actually stood up and and i love facebook memories because from day one i was like this is wrong this is bad and so like you right my kids came home uh fortunately i've always worked from home i just kept doing my thing uh but i had more time to, to document. And so now every day, cause right. Cause, cause April, March, April, boom, it's always going to be the anniversary. Right. I'm like, this is so bad. This is so wrong. And I'm seeing all these things. It took, it took like less than three weeks. Uh, I've got it. I got a picture that I've saved on my phone. It took less than three weeks for our County to create an app 
for people to report businesses, non-essential businesses that were open. Wow. And people jumped on it. So I took a screenshot of theirs and I put the Nazi logo. I'm like, hey, I, I fixed this for you. <laughs> you know, and people, oh, it's not the same. It's like, how, what do you mean it's not the same? This is neighbor turning against neighbor, literally brother against brother. You know, when you, so when you understand something like one third of Germans, I forget if it was Germans or not, or, or communists, I think it was Germans. Mm-hmm. Either way, that the principle is the same, like we're, were for the state. So they would literally turn in their family for not because it was for the greater good, you know? And I'm like, oh, and I'm, oh, but this is different. This is the global pandemic. This is a virus. People can get sick, vulnerable people. We've never seen anything like it. This isn't the government. This isn't a dig- dictator taking over. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh yeah. Cause it just, it just like snap your fingers. And this happened. People don't know like Hitler, Hitler was elected to power in, in 1933, right? It took him, and, and that wasn't his first time. It took him a good decade or more before he was given, like, total, I think, it was, what, 39, I think, mm-hmm. he was given power. I forget the timeline, but it didn't just happen, right? It's like a series of events over many, many years. And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, crap, I guess we should have stopped him one day yeah. earlier <laughs> and then he got a whole bunch of troops on methamphetamines you know rushing to the french border <laughs> yeah people don't um, so people yeah. don't know that right they literally are doping them up say go 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 yeah you know, no, there's a really good documentary on it that has it's actually on like netflix but anyway not shouting out of netflix but yeah they were juiced up these people were they were conditioned for this it wasn't immediate they were definitely conditioned but people don't see it. So, I mean, are, are you preaching to the choir or are, are, are you, are no, you I'm having, not the choir. are you, are some people saying, Hey, thanks. Like I'm, I'm seeing, I'm seeing the light. So this is the thing. Um, they, they know that it exists, but they don't know what it is. They don't, we don't have language for it. We don't understand like how social pressure works. We don't understand how they subtly, you know, manipulate headlines and imply certain things. Like, like, for example, if you want to get a group of college students, um, I love this example. If you want to get a group of college students to not drink so much, let's say, you know, drink so much, get sick. You don't say, oh, you know, 50% of college students are ending up in the hospital because of, oh, you know, drinking too much. What you would say is, you know, 50% of college students are abstaining from drinking and are using moderation. So you imply and you normalize the good behavior rather than normalize and imply the bad behavior. Um, so it's, it's very subtle. It's not always this like sexy flamboyant thing, but it exists. And if we understand the components of it, we understand how these arguments are formed and how the conditioning happens slowly over time, we can call it out. And once you call it out, you can see it. Everyone can see it. And it's really hard to hide a lie at that point. That's why the censorship is so important, obviously. Yeah, Uh, that's why I love what's going on with Twitter. Yeah. You no, know, uh, like this guy yesterday, this attorney. Well, I just you know, want to let everybody know that he didn't quote by Twitter yesterday. The, <laughs> the, the board approved to take it to a vote. I'm like, yeah, dude, I got you. But, you know, it's like saying, but like trying to tell me I, these aren't my groceries in my cart because I haven't gone to the checkout register. I, I bought these things, right? Yeah, I got to go up and pay for it, you know, now, but mm-hmm. granted, Maybe the Twinkies aren't 50% off like it said, and now I'm going to get mad and yell at the manager and storm out. Yes, it could happen. You know, but he did have a good point. He said, you know, Elon, in his due diligence, he still has an out. So if he sees something that uh, doesn't jive, he can cancel the order. And I was like, I said, that in and of itself would be worth the price of admission just to look in the closets, you know, and see what's going on. Yeah, but take a look all at the these people. <laughs> I, I I got into a a back and forth yesterday with a guy over this on Twitter. You know, he says you forcing Twitter 
to leave up a comment that they don't like is not free speech. You're compelling them to give you a platform. And, you know, something about the section 230 and said, look, if he's all oh, that applies to everybody, you, you can't be protected as not being a publisher and then act like a publisher and an editor. You know, it's like, just let, why can't people just say the most horrible things and let the, the public shout them down? I can mute you. I can block you. Why do I need three pencil neck geeks sipping $10 lattes in Silicon Valley to decide who's right and who's wrong? Yeah. Right? And these people, but they believe it. They believe they're doing the right thing. They do. Right. Everyone thinks they're a good person. <laughs> what do we do when we're surrounded by not good people? <laughs> yeah. Make the good people have some sort of um, education and backbone. Mm. Yeah, but there's there's too much TikTok. I mean, I want to I want to go watch sixteen uh, year olds, uh, you know, twerk and and eleven year old boys in drag. Oh. What was it? Good morning, America. What's the Michael Strahan? What's one is he host? Yeah, morning? I think it's good morning. Yeah. Or today. I don't know. Like TikTok, TikTok at any given time, you can go see, a, you know, a 12 year old girl doing pole dancing, you know, so it's that's a concerning platform for sure. <laughs> I know that we would need to devote another four hours to that. There's so many things distracting people. So how do we educate them? Right. Because they, you know, I call it pot porn and playoffs. You know, that's the new bread and circus. So just numb them and like, won't even have to fire a shot. Right. Everyone will just acquiesce because they, nobody knows how to fight. Nobody's willing to fight. You know, they hate the country, so they're not willing to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And even if they did love it, they they wouldn't have the ability to fight. So it seemed like a perfect storm. It's like every nation falls, right? There's, There's no more Rome. You know, obviously there's a Rome, but not the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. The sun used to never set on the British Empire. I mean, are we destined for the same thing? Well, yes and no, because I think that the current of, you know, freedom is always going to exist in humanity. And I definitely believe that America has shown and continues to show that it has this determination. If we didn't have two way, then yes, I would say, okay, maybe it's time we start packing up and (laughs) consider socialism, but we still have so many people all across this country, you know, all different political backgrounds, all different ethnic backgrounds who have a physical manifestation of their commitment to their freedom. Mm -hmm. whether they know it or not, because that's what it's for. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we also have a large group of people who are committed to freedom of speech, you know, so that we don't have to go down that down that dark alley. Um, So I don't think all hope is lost. It's just that people who are in the freedom movement, we need to grow up and start to understand these practices that the left has been using. But we consider it, oh, it's satanic, it's dark, it's magic. You know, a lot of it is psychology and a lot of it is not something we discuss, but we have to start discussing it. We have to start understanding how manipulation works. They know what they're doing and they work over incredible long periods of time. Uh, We can't just keep giving, giving our kids and our minds over to them. And think that, oh, well, we can just have a conversation with um, Kelly after she's watched nine hours of TikTok and and she'll just, you know, be convinced otherwise. That's not how it works. The Mm -hmm. human mind is way more complex than that. Words lose meaning at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have some examples of this in business? Um, You'd mentioned one. Are you. Because, you know. How do we apply this to sales and mm-hmm. marketing? Uh, but I always tell people everything is sales. You know, Ogilvy wrote, you know, like about churches, right? You can't save souls in an empty church. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm in good with my priest. I tell him that, right? And I repeat that to him. Uh, and so, like you said, propaganda, persuasion, marketing, propaganda, they're all kind of 
there's elements of each in in all of them. Um, so while we're fighting it from our governments, how can we strengthen ourselves against it? So so we're not manipulated and persuaded uh, erroneously, but if we can identify it, we can neutralize it. We can also maybe flip it around, right? And use it for our, for good. Exactly. So when it comes to it, I mean, when you tie in sales at the very root of it, um, whenever you want to convince someone to do something, you're not going to convince them logically. You're going to convince them emotionally. Um, you're going to make them feel or, or communicate. If you do this action, you're going to feel this way. You're going to get this result. And that's often tied into a feeling. So all of these different things, all of these pitch decks, all of these commercials, all of these ads, cold, you know, calls, conversations, it's all rooted in if, if you do this, it's going to be associated with this feeling. So I'm going to sell you this concept and you're going to feel this way at the end of the day. And that's ultimately how we work because that's appealing to our base, you know, brain, our, our reptilian brain. That's the brain that gets um, hijacked instant in, in, in high stress and fear response. That's why pandemics work so well to convince people to give up all their freedoms because they're in fear. They're not using logic, but when you're trying to pitch something to someone, you don't have to scare them about it necessarily. You can just say, Hey, if you get these new blinds, you know, it's going to improve your home and the quality of your home. If you get this new car, it's, this is all the status and the feeling you'll, you know, the pride you'll get from this car and the safety and things like that. So, so yeah, um, it all ties back into understanding ultimately what it is that person wants and, and how they want to feel. And then associating your language and your imagery to, you know, support that. Um, can we do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Obviously, propaganda is, is going one to many. Yeah. Uh, do you have tips and tricks, you know, doing this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, in that, in that sales scenario, selling blinds, selling home remodeling, selling cars? Yeah. Um, well, it, um, it starts with the propagandist always understands the audience. They understand who it is they're selling to. Um, because if you understand why they want something or what it, what's in it for them, you can effectively pitch that. So if I know that you are concerned about, you know, you want to redo your lawn or your landscaping, and I want to sell that to you, I would understand what's your motivation. Oh, you want to make sure you look good in the neighborhood. You want to make sure you can show up to your, your friends and family, things like that, whatever it is. When I message around that and I create media around that to support that, I'm going to be more effective. But if most people, they trip up and they sell what they want and what they think they want, and they don't care. It's as a propagandist, as a marketer, it's not about you and what you want. It's about your end client or customer or target. <laughs> and that's, that's the, that's the first uh, place that people trip up. They, they always make it about them. You need to make it about, or they always make it about themselves. Um, you need it to make it about the target, no matter what. Yeah. I always, always tell people, you know, you are not your client. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, we as salespeople, we have to change how we sell to match how the prospect buys. You know, it's so, but you, you've got to, you've got to, you got to master the rules before you can break them. Yes. You know, example I always use like, like Eddie Van Halen, you know, playing a guitar, you know, Stevie Ray Vaughan, you get these great guitarists, you see them pop a string and they won't stop. They just know how to manipulate the chords, right? Change their finger placement to get the sound they want from five strings instead of six, but you wouldn't teach that, right? Like Tiger Woods doesn't practice standing backwards, holding the club, you know, at the, on the steel and swinging left-handed, you know, backwards because he's up against a tree or something, but because he's has practiced so much, he can see how to adjust to the situation to do what needs to be done. But very few people really want to take, 
the time and effort to become an expert. Exactly. Okay. So they, they, they can't shift like that. They just, oh, I learned one thing. So now everything's a, every, I, only, I have a hammer. So I'm just going to go, everything's a nail, therefore, and just whack, whack, whack. Um, yeah. And that's what makes a propagandist so dangerous is that they are using you. When you're entering the realm of systems and subconscious minds, which is ultimately what you're doing if you're a marketer or propagandist, whatever, you have to deal with huge data sets, like a lot of information, and you have to make constant adjustments on the fly. You have to use your intuition to be able to look at your target, look at your client and quickly assess and, and message to them. So it, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty um, intense weapon to have once you know how to quickly um, assess and then message. Yeah. And most people don't know how to message. It's, um, they say the same thing over and over again. I, and, you know, I guess it's a good thing because that gives me a job. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and it gives someone like me a huge advantage because so much of it is wrapped around y- your confidence, how much confidence you have in what it is you're selling. A lot of the times propagandists, they're not selling you anything that's going to be good for you. They're not actually you know, uh, correct in any of the things that they're saying, but they have so much confidence and they know that it's not about logic. It's not about what's right or wrong. It matters about repetition. They understand how the mind works. If you just keep saying this big lie over again, as, as an example, eventually people will believe it. So having that confidence and that persistence, um, is really what's going to, to change minds. Well, and I think, I think Trump fell for that. Was it Dr. Is it Burks or Bricks? I forget the lady. Um, you know, it was her job. The scarf lady. Yeah. 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 I think Burks. I know it's B-I-R-X or B-R-I-X, one or the other. Mm-hmm. But I think she was super confident. Fauci was super confident. And because people are like, how does this happen? Blah, blah, blah. And I like, like Trump didn't God. You know, they've done plenty of studies. They you know, they, mm-hmm. they bring you in, they, they'll have five or 10 or 20 people in a room. And, you know, you look at the lines with the arrows. Hey, so which one is, is the shortest, right? And like yes. 19 people go, oh, number one, number one, number one. You're like, number two is the shortest. Like, it's so obvious. But you're like, oh, okay, I guess. Yeah, number one. I mean, they've done so many studies like that where people go along, but everybody's like, oh, yeah, I'd be different the hell you would you're wearing two masks and and goggles and i mean a year over a year ago january so january 21 i flew to tampa Uh and there was a family of three full-on guard like like working in a clean room full gloves full body suit uh, head oh 14 months ago i'm like like if it was that dangerous why would you leave why would you bring your child in that environment? Right. I, I saw something last summer, you know, I used to live in Austin and, and there was some amoeba or bacteria or something in one of the, in, in the ponds, in the lakes that were like deadly to dogs. They're like, don't bring your dogs to these open bodies of water, right? They're going to get super sick and die. And so nobody went to that water. But like COVID, oh, you're going to get super sick and die unless you wear this little mask. Yeah. But if you're eating a pretzel, you can take it off and, and just sip your Coke and eat your pretzel. And after 30 minutes or an hour, go ahead and put your mask back on. Right. It's like we're, we're more protective of our dogs than our yeah. children. Right. And people don't see the the discrepancy. I just oh, and it's like, you know, you got to pick your battles. Right. I just want to punch everybody in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. And that's why, you know, so many people like I get this question a lot is like, how is it like so many smart people fell for all of this? And again, it comes into how their brain is functioning. People intelligence, like the true way to, to determine someone's intelligence is their ability to do pattern recognition and see patterns over time. Most people are good these 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 scientists and these academics they're good at memorization they memorize things and then they repeat it 
and build upon it and follow a very straight narrative. They're not lateral thinkers. They don't think outside the box. They literally follow that one path. So, so yeah, that's how you can easily say, oh, put this piece of paper on your face and it will protect you. I told people so many times, if a piece of fabric like really protected people, we would see murals everywhere throughout time. We would see ancient Chinese paintings, ancient statues with people with the, you know, the masks on, because it would be something that human human beings would have found out long ago when diseases were significantly more. Yeah, but they didn't have modern science and and N95 and <laughs> 0.004 micrometer. No, uh-uh, to, uh, no. <laughs> no, well, you know, and it's crazy because during the fires in California, they said, oh, these masks, they won't help you. They won't protect you from, from the, the, the fire and the, and the particulates from that but it's going to help you against a virus that is infinitely small. Like it's incredibly small. So it's, it's just crazy that they well, there's don't. multiple layers. Okay. It's the micrometer. It's, it's layering. Yeah. It doesn't just stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just, and that also shows, you know, especially around the whole Disney time where Disney is like, you know, going woke and going broke right now, um, how people's imaginations are just totally, you know, broken down. Like Mm -hmm. people don't have the imagination to just picture, okay, if something this big can get through my mask, something smaller naturally would be able to, like, they don't have that creativity. And as a marketer, as a propagandist, you are the ones selling this image. You are selling them this image and, and giving them form and meaning and helping, you know, shape their imagination. Right. Like you take hold completely of their mind. And, and so many people just willingly give it up, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I've seen it. I, it was a good point you brought up with, with like medical doctors. You know, we, we worship <laughs> these people. They wear their white robes. We hold them in high regard. We, we whisper in their presence, right? But that, like you're right, it's memorization. It is. Um, and I, so back to back, like literally the same week um, this year. So it was, I, I could look through my text messages and it was, I want to say even like early March, so like within two months, uh, two separate medical doctor friends of mine that do not know each other. One's in Utah, one's in um, Nebraska. They wrote you the same email. <laughs> uh, no, it worse. They they basically they they drove home the point that they are not free to truly practice medicine. Mm. Okay, my my friend in in Nebraska uh, said, you know, they I'd have to pull it up, but it was so it it, it just it just hit me. He's like. They're, uh, he said they're quote not allowed to go off the reservation. That's what he said. Exactly. The, they have procedure. They have procedure, and you know, if you want to t- try ivermectin, or whatever, no. And my friend in in Utah said his entire hospital was put on some kind of restriction or warning, uh, uh, and and extra inspection and, and oversight because too many of them were practicing medicine, treating each patient individually and writing prescriptions that they didn't agree with. And it's like, how can that be? It's like people, they, like you study Vietnam, right? Guys would literally be getting shot at calling the radio. It'd go from the foxhole to the division, to the headquarters in Seoul, patched all the way to LBJ, sitting in his fat ass, would have telephone his boots and cigar saying, yeah, y'all can't shoot back today. Yes. Right. So imagine Fauci hanging out in DC. You got to interrupt him at a, at a thousand dollar steak dinner and go, Hey doc. Yeah. Um, we've got this female, uh, out in Los Angeles. Uh, she's presenting, uh, blah, blah, blah. And we'd like to prescribe this medicine. Mm, no, just, uh, you know what? Give her, give her something else. Uh, do you want to see her charts? No denied (laughs) it's like when you lay it out you go how is that okay it's not and that's why we have so much evidence that ties into why 
communism, why centralized power does not work. It's all about decentralization. That's why America's right. work so well. The state's rights, the local government, because people, you know, in their communities, you know, in that context, there's so many different factors to consider. Mm -hmm. This doctor knows what Barbara or Kelly or James needs, not Fauci in some, you know, corporate yeah. tower somewhere or the WHO unelected. Yeah, well, we, we saw this in the military going back decades when we when things started improving with the Soviet Union and then Russia. Um, and we would do some exercises and with the Russians and, and our counterparts would, they would see like our lowliest infantry man, like E1, a private, I mean, just quote unquote, nobody mm -hmm. had maps, GPS, uh, full communications, knew the mission. And they were like, Whoa, what? Like only their top people even had maps. Right. Because they they were so in control. You know, when you read like the Gulag uh, Archipelago, uh, Solzhenitsyn, um, one of his first crimes was that he served on you know the Russian Western Front, right? Germany's Eastern Front. Mm -hmm. And he he saw how the world was outside of the, the Eastern Bloc, yeah. right? Outside of communist Russia. And they're like, oh no, this guy. He knows how good it can be. So let's, let's lock him up for a decade. You know, they can't have the word getting out. And people, they, they don't want to believe that, that things can be that bad, right? And, and the reason this applies, right? Like I'm, I'm discussing this on the sales podcast, right? It's like everything is sales. It is. Everything you is sales. And, mm -hmm. and there are manipulative salespeople. There are manipulative, hostile buyers, Yes. Okay. Customers can be a pain in the ass. Like today, just terminated a contract, I had a non-responsive client mm. and they're, they're trying to place the blame. Like I was a consultant, right? I'm like, y'all aren't hiring an employee. They didn't want to do what I was telling. Uh, glaring issues. I'm like, oh, this is so easy to fix. Gave them a script. Oh, well, can you build this as a flow chart? <laughs> Uh, firing clients is necessary. <laughs> I, I wrote a six page script with like, with multiple variables and, and granted it was a little complex if you're new, because, you know, if, if you respond with a, then I have a response for a, but if you come back with B, then you got to skip down to the next page and read B, you know? So, but it's, it, it, it wasn't, you know, differential equations, right? It was just scroll down and read and go do it a few times. And then it'll, it'll start to flow. Well, can we have this as a flow chart? Well, you didn't give us a flow chart. You didn't do this. We want to cancel. I'm like, okay, done. I said, you know what? We had a 90 day agreement. You only paid one month. I will cancel this agreement. Good luck. <laughs> you know, and, and I know I should have done it because when you start cringing, when you open your emails, Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I probably need to fire these people. But yeah. it's like, I like them, right? They're, it's a nice family-owned business. They, they do good work. They mean well. They have so much potential, you know, and they come to you because they're struggling. Mm -hmm. But then they, you throw them a lifeline and people want to sit in their own misery, right? And I've done it. I, you know, you go, go get golf lessons. And, and you know what to do and you get up on the tee and all your buddies are watching and you got a whopping dollar bet on this hole, right? But it's more the bragging rights, right? And you fall back in your old routine because it's comfortable. Yes. You know, instead of, oh, trust the golf pro, you paid for the lesson. Oh, and then you're mad at yourself. Like, I'm an idiot. I knew I was going to slice it. And I've got the cure for the slice. I didn't do it. Oh, I'm just worthless. But then it didn't you circle the drain and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to recognize that in ourselves and how bad people will use our weaknesses against us. Definitely. We got to fight it, you we know? Do. So I'm yeah, fighting. 
So I'm glad you're fighting the fight, right? So you got your website. I'm going to, I'm going to read everything. Um, Propagandafluent.com, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's your name all across the board. Um, Yeah, you can find me. Yeah. Uh, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. That's where I've been following you. Uh, So keep fighting the good fight. Uh, You're not alone. (laughs) <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. There's a lot of people who are hungry out here. And and I, I'm going to use this persuasion. So so now that you've been on the podcast, you must come drink wine with me in the Temecula Valley. I, I think that's going to be easy to convince <laughs> you to do. <laughs> All right. Layla Gray, and it's G-R-E-Y, Layla Gray, all the way from L-A, propagandafluent.com. Thanks for coming on the show. It's been great. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too. I think she's on to something. That's why I had her on the show. So give it another listen. Check out her her podcast. Check out her YouTube, her Instagram. She goes live there quite often. Um, you know, surround yourself with smart people. Even if you disagree with them, probably you should follow them more closely. Um it was so interesting. One of um, my friends, he's a, a local priest. He was a priest at our parish uh, for many years, and um, he got transferred. He's still in SoCal, but um, he's out towards Palm Desert, uh, Palm Springs area. But uh, he's a retired history professor. He's actually a married priest. He uh, came over from the Anglican uh, faith. And so actually my current priest right now at Holy Martyrs, the married priest, so there was a whole uh, movement that uh, was set in place to make that happen, uh, going back 25 years. But uh, Father Gregory, he's he's a historian, uh, you know, college professor, priest, and um, we were just chatting the other day on Facebook, and he was talking about you know the court jester, and um, the the idea was, you know, good kings that understood. Uh, the value of being grounded and hearing things from the other side would have, they'd employ themselves, uh, employ a court jester. So this person was not only allowed to, but tasked to call the king out on his BS. It could be anything from you look ridiculous in that clothing, you're putting on weight. Uh, But, you know, he can mock and make fun of anything. Uh, you know, like the whole Obama administration. You know, when you go look at the thousands of drones that were drone strikes that his administration employed and the thousands of people killed children, innocent people. You know, it's uh, they want to, you know, those that control the media want you to think, oh, he was just this nice guy. It's like BS. All these presidents do crazy things. But nobody's around to call them on it. But regardless, you know, my point is, even if you don't agree with her take on things, that's probably all the more reason to pay attention. Understand the weaknesses in your own argument. It will make your position stronger. But you must have the courage and the confidence to invite opposing opinions very few people can do that though you know all the time we were just talking um, last week we had some friends over and my wife was telling the story of how I always invite in the missionaries uh, the LDS the Jehovah's Witnesses you know a um, I appreciate what they're doing the courage and the commitment and the faith that it takes to spend your time doing that i've never done it i've never gone door to door saying hey can i talk to you about jesus never done it i do it publicly i you know write from today's reading i've written that daily for five years i've never gone door to door So I appreciate what these people are doing. I know that they mean well. I think that they are off in their beliefs. And that's the other reason I bring them in is to have a discussion. Um, Maybe I can ask some questions that will get them thinking. I also keep them from knocking on my neighbor's door. My neighbor may be weaker in their faith and may be led astray. 
Okay, but I know that I am strong enough in my faith to withstand questions and critiques from them. And many times they will ask questions that I don't know the answer to, so it forces me to go research. But again, I have the faith, the confidence that my faith is correct and that the answer is out there and I can go find it. Today in jiu-jitsu, you know, I tried some new moves, failed right away. I mean, like literally immediately. And I was like, what the heck? I thought I knew it. Right? I came home, looked up some videos. I saw the one thing I did wrong. And that one thing was super important, <laughs> but I still got it wrong. Uh, so tomorrow I'm going to do it and I will do it much better. But I love the sport. I don't mind making a mistake. Because like they say, there's you know, you win or you learn. So surround yourself with smart people. Welcome the input of those on the other side. You know, the whole concept of, of a devil's advocate comes from the Catholic Church. When they nominate someone to be sainted. Right. They go through some steps, you know, they're beatified and blessed and um, and then eventually named a saint or they're not. But the church appoints an advocate for the devil, someone who looks for rational, scientific explanations for things people claim are miracles. They go investigate their history. Right. Like, was this a bad person? So. You know, because the Catholic Church doesn't want erroneous saints, phony saints. So that's where that concept comes from. I encourage you to do the same. You know, people, I believe in science. I follow science. The mere fact that somebody claims that their mind is made up because they follow science proves they are full of shit. True science says, hey, I have this idea. Hello, scientific world. Please show me why I'm wrong. Google it. Google the scientific method. It's been around for hundreds of years. To state something definitively because of science means you're an idiot. Welcome the attacks, okay? The more attacks that your vantage point your concept can withstand the stronger it gets and strong people join me in the sell more of everything program you're strong right yeah go ahead you can do it on your own it'll just take it longer you'll suffer more you'll make less money you'll have less fun but hey on your deathbed when you die an early death due to stress and exhaustion you can say hey but i got here alone good grief don't do that. All right. Come join us. Sell more of everything.com. I'll go sell something. <laughs>